Good day from New York. My name is Dr. Leon Perman. I'm the head of the Digital Financial Services Observatory, a project housed at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation at Columbia Business School in New York. And I want to welcome everybody to our webinar on infrastructure security and digital financial services. Uh, this is the last of the webinars for this year. It's been a very successful uh, series, and I'm very glad that everybody from around the world can join us. So it's a one-hour webinar. Um, just some housekeeping notes, please. Uh, please keep your microphone and video off throughout the webinar. Um, and while you're welcome to send questions through the uh, chat box, please don't ask any questions via audio at any time. Um, the questions will, uh, will be um, asked after the uh, presentation. So the agenda, a quick introduction to the observatory, uh, 45 minutes of webinar, uh, then we're going to do two quick polls, and then a live 10, 15 minute Q&A uh, session, and then a short wrap up. And for those uh, who want to uh, um, do it, there's a post-webinar optional live, live quiz where you can earn a certificate from uh, the DFSI. So just about the observatory, um, it, if you go to dfsobservatory.com, you'll see we have a legal and regulatory database on DFS, which we've uh, got about 58, 59 countries now. Uh, model laws and regulations we're developing. We've got our annual summits, webinars, roundtables. We've got one on January the 17th, 2018 on humanitarian crises and uh, DFS. Number of publications that we're working on, commentaries and analysis of new laws and regulations, and we work with a number of bodies uh, around the world. Again, uh, this is the, the website. You're very welcome to browse through it. Um, and uh, the, the webinars themselves uh, from, from the past uh, uh, year, uh, as well as the conferences and the roundtable are all on our online video archive. And it's very easy to navigate and, and find them. Again, about the webinar certificate of attendance, uh, you need to attend six webinars and get 60% each for the post-webinar live quiz. Uh, it's a multiple choice questions, uh, about 10 questions. Uh, you need to log into your DFSO account with your username and password from the DFSO. Uh, important note, the quiz is only live for two hours post-webinar for certificate purposes. If you do it after those two hours, then it won't count for certificate purposes. And importantly, uh, the, uh, the questions are based on the content of the slides, not necessarily what is said. So you need to be very attentive to the actual content on the slides themselves. Uh, this is the uh, webinar team at Columbia. Uh, that's me sort of in the middle at the top. Uh, that's Columbia University, which uh, doesn't look like that today because there's a bit of a snowstorm in uh, New York and it's pretty cold here. And I want to thank um, Michael and, and Nora and the team for coming in early for the webinar uh, today. So on to the, uh, the webinar topic, infrastructure security and DFS uh, it's, it's an evolving and a very important and almost underreported issue. Uh, and what we'll see is there's, there's, uh, there's quite a few vulnerabilities, but the good news is that uh, there, there are a number of initiatives to deal with them and some, some mitiga mitigants for the, for the vulnerabilities. Um, it's an important topic uh, in the sense that uh, a number of actors are starting to bad actors are starting to get involved in in trying to uh, to hack into systems. You'll see these are some headlines for the past few months. We're going to talk about uh, signaling system seven or SS seven um, hacks of central banks, uh, uh, malware, and fraud. Um, these are all evolving uh, fraud actions by bad actors. Um, you can see how it's evolved. Uh, this is a slide from a Swift presentation on the evolution of, of, of hacking. You can see in 2001, it was really nuisance uh, type style with uh, people uh, creating viruses or worms. Uh, to today, where we've got disruptive attacks and evolving to destructive attacks. Um, and these are almost industrial strength cyber gangs and even state actors that get involved in, in destroying infrastructure through, uh, through malware and uh, various other cyber intrusions. 
So in relation to DFS, or uh, we're going to use the term DFS, digital financial services and mobile financial services interchangeably, but um, um, they some some people equate them, but we'll, we'll stick with DFS today. Um, there's three vulnerabilities we can talk about. The first two at the top, one in blue, the one in gray in the middle, are the ones we, we're going to go into great depth about at the mobile network operator level and the financial infrastructure level. So. At the MNO level, there's exploitation and attacks on signaling system seven, uh, which we'll get into. The USSD bearer channel, of course, USSD is what you uh, find in a lot of um, countries that that uh, have DFS, uh, where the interface is via uh, um, USSD on feature funds. Uh, also, mobile base station intercepts, and then attack on uh, at the financial infrastructure level, attacks on central bank and switch. Um, systems and uh, as well as phishing attacks which are becoming more and more prevalent so these are in summary of these are the type of uh, of intercepts intrusions hacks if you will uh, we had a, a webinar a few months ago in June uh, given by professor Kevin Butler University of Florida uh, on vulnerabilities in DFS apps you're very welcome to go online uh, and, and, and check uh, Professor Butler's excellent uh, webinar. But for the moment, we're going to look at the one on the left, uh, SS7 and USSD uh, intercepts, IMSI catches, and uh, uh, phone number spoofing. So a bit of a primer on telecommunication networks and infrastructure in DFS. Uh, we're going to talk at length about something called Signaling System 7 or SS7. Really, this is the DNA of the telecommunications infrastructure globally. It's a 1975-era telecommunications protocol still used by most fixed-line and uh, mobile operators around the world to connect it to each other. Um, and they connected to each other uh, in the sense that uh, if you get off an airplane and uh, you switch on your phone, uh, you you roam. So the way that works is that the country that you land in, uh, the mobile network operator there checks who you are and sends a message to your home network and says, can uh, Leon roam in, in this country? And yes or no, and presto, within a few seconds of SS7, you get permission to to um, the room. You also start getting SMSs and WhatsApp messages uh, because your data is enabled. So it's it's critical. It's critical also for the billing. So that any any phone calls or SMSs or anything else you do in the in the roaming country gets sent back to your home network. Again, all over SS7. Little snark we're there. Uh, in 1975, when uh, SS7 was created, it was believe it or not in today's age it was by design created with no security. And that's the reason for that, again, contextually at the time was around the, in the 1970s, uh, most of the telecommunication providers in the world, uh, there wasn't really mobile. Uh, it just Mobile had just been invented about two years back in 1973. Uh, the telecommunication networks were all state-owned. Uh, so they trusted each other. Um, so, well, we trust each other, we need no security. Uh, and But now, in today's age, where you've got uh, state actors actually trying to bring down other networks, and you've got uh, hackers and, and other bad actors, uh, security becomes critical. Um, but it's it's trying to unscramble the egg in some way. Uh, because the SS7 was built with no security, uh, you can't layer uh, innate security into it and onto it, um, but with, with easily. So you've got to look for preventative messages, uh, methods, and other mitigants to to check that um, SS7 hasn't been uh, um, exploited. And to that point, uh, ex exploits of uh, SS7 is not really a hack. Uh, it's an exploit, plain and simple. It's the equivalent of leaving your front door open, uh, and and uh, and somebody comes and robs you. They don't need to bash down the door break a window to get into your into your home. They just walk in. And that's that's the SS7 issue. It's open. It's the, the information is in clear text, uh, in most cases unencrypted, so it's just a walk-in. 
um, if you get access to the SS7 network. We'll, we'll talk about how that's done. So just a, a brief technical slide. Uh, uh, the important points here is this is how everything is interconnected. Uh, the layers through which uh, the international networks talk to each other is by something called uh, signal transfer point. And we'll talk about how the, uh, the role of SDP or signal transfer point in, in, in um, mitigating SS7 vulnerabilities. Uh, quite an important um, mitigant. But that essentially is how uh, SS7 networks talk to each other. Okay, so something you'll be very familiar with if you uh, uh, if you're a DFS aficionado is USSD. Uh, not really well known in in the in the, the age of um, smartphone apps, but critical in the feature phone world um, using uh, USSD for access to to, um, to DFS services. So USSD. Unstructured Supplementary Service Data is an active GSM technology protocol developed in the 1980s uh, to provide GSM uh, mobile services over the SS7 network. So there you'll see on the right-hand side, SS7 in red, that's your infrastructure, your 1975 era infrastructure. Uh, and then built on top of that is the GSM layer. So mobile, the mobile component, GSM, sits on top of SS7, and within that, You've got something called mobile application part map. So within, and that that really is the GSM component sitting on top of uh, SS7 map. So within map, you've got your USSD and SMS. Um, and of course, uh, USSD is now used globally for DFS access and uh, the user interface and to transport the session-based DFS data, otherwise known as a bearer. So USSD is the interface and a bearer, the bearer being the transport of information layer. And interestingly enough about uh, USSD and SMS, they were never meant to be used in the way we use them at the moment. They were actually um, built as engineering uh, um, uh, devices, if you will, for GSM engineers to talk to each other and back to the system. So um, eventually it was, it, uh, USSD and SMS were commercialized um, and very successfully, and I think uh, the world has, has has benefited from that. But we still need, we still got this vulnerability. So it's not that uh, the GSM uh, layer uh, um, mitigated the SS7 layer; it almost encased it. So why is this important for DFS? So as I said, uh, in the majority of the uh, um, the uh, majority of DFS in the developing world is feature phone based, not smartphone based. And this is likely to, to be around for quite a while, well past uh, 2020 there, where feature phones and basic phones uh, using SMS, uh, some toolkit and USSD are used as the user interface and bearer for, for access to DFS services. So, because MNOs rely on signaling system uh, seven to uh, transmit USSD and SMS, you've you've got this issue. So, any threats to SS seven, which we'll go into, are threats to USSD and therefore threats to DFS provision. I think that's the big take-home message today. Uh, this has implications for the integrity of DFS transactions and systems and risk. Uh, inter alia affects the contractual rights between service providers, possibly, uh, because these might need to be revised. Because at the moment, if you look at your terms or conditions, even your bank or your service provider will say, if there's a hack, you're responsible. Because you must have given away your PIN, or you must have allowed some intrusion, some phishing, or, or the like. So, in the context of these uh, ventilated SS7 um, exploits, that contractual asymmetry uh, may not necessarily be true uh, anymore uh, because the networks themselves can are, are vulnerable to uh, to intrusion through SS7. 
Uh, there is, unfortunately, a fragmented and consistent response by industry and regulators to the SS7 issue up to now, but this, as we'll see later, is being coordinated. There's now uh, technology uh, um, being employed uh, to mitigate and prevent SS7 uh, vulnerabilities and also some supranational um, uh, uh, initiatives to uh, to look at SS7 vulnerabilities and how to how to mitigate them. So let's look at some examples of threats and intrusions. Um, and we'll talk about the interception of uh, telecommunication network data using signaling system 7 as an example. So bad actor exploits SS7 and USSD. It's, uh, as I said, uh, the SS7 is the DNA of, of, um, of telecommunications around the world. And what the bad actors are doing is they're piggybacking on legitimate SMS messages. So they actually, as I said, they're not hacking per se, they're exploiting. So they're exploiting legitimate SMS messages for nefarious purposes. Um, the attacker doesn't need sophisticated equipment. Um, very simply, you just need what's called global title for universal SSS, SS7 access. So for example, some networks around the world will provide global title to those providing bulk SMS services. So, so a bulk SMS provider will get global title uh, by, by paying um, maybe a few hundred uh, US dollars and uh, is able to send bulk SMSs, thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of, of text messages um, uh, at a time through SS7. And importantly, this is these are remote uh, vulnerabilities. The access and intrusions can be done from anywhere in the world, and we'll see there's a slight difference in that and and some other vulnerabilities um, using SS7. And uh, so the effect of these MNO level exploits on the via SS7 and USSD, uh, you can discover customers' location and and uh, disrupt the services. You can intercept SMSs and one-time passwords, so the stuff that's used for banking. Uh, if you add a beneficiary, uh, sometimes your bank sends you a text message and says, uh, please type in this one-time password, and then the, the new beneficiary in your, in your bank uh, banking application uh, will be uh, authenticated, and you can send the money to the, to the, new, to the new beneficiary. Those OTPs, uh, even WhatsApp OTPs, where you when you use when you change phones, uh, WhatsApp sends you an OTP. So, unfortunately, these uh, text messages uh, containing the OTPs can be intercepted because of uh, the SS7 vulnerability. You can also create fraudulent USSD requests, uh, and what we'll see also is undertake customer voice call redirection conversation tapping, um, and this is also number spoofing, and even uh, at, a, at a destructive level disrupt available of the mobile switch. So these are just some of the examples of what's possible if you have global title in Europe and, you, and you've and you got bad intentions. Um, to the point that this isn't uh, theory, uh, you'll see from the first slide the, uh, the, um, on, on the headlines about the um, SSM vulnerabilities that there was a major uh, intrusion in Germany a few months ago, a couple hundred thousand euros was uh, was stolen um, based on interception of OTPs. Um, but what this slide is showing is a test of 12 MNOs running DFS systems. And this was run by what's called uh, white hack hackers. So people that were invited in to test vulnerabilities in these 12 MNOs running DFS systems. And you'll see uh, what the white hats were able to accomplish um, using SS7 and USSD exploits. They were able to obtain balance data, steal subscriber data, hijack incoming text messages, track the locations of the users, eavesdrop on conversations, and right at the bottom, um, in 60% of the case, they were able to move funds in DFS via this, this SS7 um, exploitation. So an, another issue relating to SS7 is something called uh, 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 IMSI catcher, otherwise known as fake mobile base stations, also in the US known as Stingrays, because the Stingray was the first 
fact, mobile base station used by law enforcement purposes. In fact, law, uh, law enforcement around the world use this. It's now being co-opted by the bad actors uh, to do man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, and what, what this does is intercept data, voice, SMS, USSD, uh, data between phones and the mobile base stations. So compared to the do it from anywhere SS7 um, exploit intrusion, uh, these are local uh, interceptions. And you can see at the bottom um, the say for an agent is an agent talking to a customer, interacting at a under an umbrella, um, doing a cash in or cash out, if you will, and the hacker sits there with a uh, IMSI catcher. Uh, and intercepts the information going to the to and from the base station. And this could be uh, pin numbers or any other valuable data that allows the the bad actor to uh, to 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 uh, access the account or even listen to a phone call. So these are pretty small devices. The hacker hacker can uh, hide the these MZ catcher stingrays in the in the backpack. And just to show you how absolutely very easy it is to create one of these things. Uh, here's, here's an example of one, um, and you, it's a DIY easy catcher. Uh, this really creates a fake base station. And for less than 400 US dollars, including the cost of the laptop, you can create this uh, this MZ catcher. Um, so if you look at the circuit board in the middle of the picture, uh, you can go to eBay. I uh, took a look at uh, what it cost there. Is a hack RF radio baseband card, uh, which you need, and that's uh, currently about $174 on, on eBay. Uh, and it's got two antennas there. Uh, one's used for, uh, for jamming uh, the encryption, and the other one's used for, um, uh, for, for intercepting the data. So you jam the encryption so the phone is, is, is brought down to a non encrypted state. Um, and on the left, you'll see that uh, there's free software. It's called OpenBTS software. Uh, you can load it onto a laptop and just download it. And within a few minutes, hey presto, you've got an MZ catcher and you can listen to phone calls and the like. It's very worrying, but this has been around for a while. If you Google MZ catchers, you'll see tons and tons of incidences where this has been used. In fact, the Washington Post did a little study where they sent a reporter out with a, with, um, uh, uh, they checked for the presence of uh, IMSI catchers and they found that uh, IMSI catchers were present at a number of embassies around uh, Washington, D.C. Um, go, go, go read that very interesting report in the Washington Post. So just Google that and you'll, you'll see it. So another vulnerability based on SS7 is uh, what we call uh, trusted number spoofing. So really what this does is use the SS7 layer to emulate the caller line ID. So you, you're the bad actor, you go into the SS7 layer and you say, I want to make a call. And what is produced on the person's phone that, you, that you're calling is the, whatever number the, the bad actor inputs. So in, in, uh, in one case that we found in the wild, uh, in a very elaborate hoax uh, of DFS agents looking for refunds where the customer goes into theatrics and complains that the cash out hasn't been uh, um, uh, sufficient and that they're going to call the, the call center and complain about the agent. Uh, hey presto, a few minutes later, the call center number appears on the agent's screen and tells the, the agent to uh, refund or give extra money to the to the person complaining right next to them, or else the, uh, the agents can be blacklisted or, or something to that effect. And the agents, uh, in some cases, uh, because they trust the caller line ID, and it's coming from the uh, service provider call center, uh, uh, gives the money uh, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the hoaxer. Um, another uh, method is social engineering. Um, Again, using the call center uh, um, a motif, where they call and extract, try to extract DFS and bank credentials from the customer, ultimately leading to financial loss. So the, these are actually in the wild. This is this is happening now, unfortunately. 
So let's uh, now move on to financial infrastructure. Again, I've given you all the, the threats and vulnerabilities. As I said at the beginning, there are some um, methods to, to mitigate and prevent this, and we'll go into them, so it's not all bad news. But uh, financial infrastructure layer, a little complicated slide, um, but if you if you focus on it for a few seconds, you'll see it's it's it. What it shows is um, how money is sent from from one bank bank customers to another across international boundaries through the SWIFT network. In fact, this is uh, the a slide again from from SWIFT. Um, so. The, what I what I wanted to show was uh, there at the bottom left. You'll see inside of fraud uh, is is a major component of um, of infrastructure vulnerabilities, uh, especially with uh, with malware. So we'll give an example of that. And what's called uh, now called uh, the Bangladesh Bank heist. Um, probably a movie piece coming out soon. Uh, but this affected Bangladesh Bank around February 2016. And what happened was thieves compromised Bangladesh Bank's computer network, how they through malware observed how the transfers were done in their systems and gained access to Bangladesh Bank's SWIFT access codes. Now SWIFT of course is as I showed on that previous slide is the is the, the method used to uh, transfer money internationally. Often when you transfer money you'll see it ask you for your bank SWIFT code. So that's kind of the address of, of receiving um, the bank. Uh, and for the banks themselves, they need access codes to transfer transfer money. And in Bangladesh Bank's case, uh, uh, they they house their, their bank, the Bangladesh Bank's own bank, if you will. Uh, their, their funds were housed at, uh, and still are housed at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. There's a picture of it there, down the road from where I am now. Uh, and five transactions were taken uh, from the uh, were were were, uh, were taken from the bank Bangladesh bank account. Uh, Twenty million to Sri Lanka that was recovered. Eighty-one million to the Philippines, and eighty million of that was recovered. Uh, the New York Fed were were uh, quickly onto this, and they blocked the remaining thirty transactions um, of eight hundred fifty million US dollars. And a forensic investigation found that uh, the Tridex malware was used for the attacks. In other words, the malware is installed on Bangladesh Bank computers, uh, and the bad actors monitored um, what SWIFT codes were used. So again, um, the 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 money was taken from uh, the New York Fed based on legitimate SWIFT code missed, uh, access codes. Uh, FBI says that North Korea is behind the uh, theft, and since then SWIFT has uh, advised banks using the SWIFT Alliance access system, which is part of that slide that I showed you previously, to strengthen their cybersecurity posture and ensure that they're following proper SWIFT security guidelines. And I think uh, um, now there are, are secondary checks on all balance transfers from uh, from central banks to, to to other banks. So that's one of the improvements. So again, what's what's been done about this? Um, to encapsulate the issue, uh, we've now got cybersecurity payment standards, risk frameworks, and policies versus evolving unique security challenges of, of uh, new ecosystems. So while we're working with protection and response now, uh, we have to evolve into what's called cyber resilience. So it's no longer just about protection; it's about cyber resilience where you anticipate what the attack will be and do something about it. So there are some regulatory and supranational initiatives to to, um, to counter this. Um, one of these is by the Bank for International Settlements or the CPMI component of VIS, the guidance on cyber resilience uh, released last year, dealing with financial market infrastructure. FMI is really uh, um, the important component of the financial system say credit card networks or bank transfer networks or switches uh, um, and, and fintech companies uh, providing payment services or P2P services. So those are those within the uh, BIS definition of financial market infrastructure and really what makes the money world go round and round. Um, very critical. FMIs are very critical. So you need to 
be cyber resilient to avoid um, exploits and, and theft of funds. And what the BIS says uh, is that cyber, sound cyber governance is key. Uh, board and senior management attention is critical. Um, the the they sh FMI should make use of good quality threat intelligence, rigorous testing. Uh, and one of those things is, is, is our red teams. Uh, a red team is like the white hacked hacker, is somebody that goes in unannounced and, and tries to hack and then gives a report on all the vulnerabilities. Um, but importantly, what the BIS uh, um, cyber resilience framework says is that, and I agree completely with this, it cannot be achieved by an FMI alone. Some of these are, are smallish FMIs, it's collective endeavor of the whole ecosystem. So everything on the SWIFT to the central bank to the telecommunications network, uh, all need to be involved in a, in a, in a um, cyber resilient framework. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk earlier, uh, later about certs. Um, which are important components in the cyber resilience uh, uh, initiatives. So at a regulatory level, again, uh, let's look at uh, what Central Bank of Morocco are doing in terms of cyber resilience of their FMIs in their financial infrastructure. They issued a cyber resilience circular for banks uh, a few months ago, uh, list the main security principles and um, obligations to FMIs and all members of the payment and banking systems with that the Central Bank of Morocco um, oversee need to need to abide by. Uh, and what you see from the slide below is uh, they've taken on an important role as coordinator and overseer of, of um, uh, cyber resilience and, uh, and, and, and the coordination thereof. So they're not just a passive central bank watching money go backwards and forwards. They actually uh, invested themselves in cyber resilient frameworks. Similarly, uh, the Central Bank of Jordan uh, earlier this year uh, developed a risk management framework and implementation plan that revolves around um, USSD vulnerabilities and specifically how that may affect a DFS uh, system called Joma Pay, Joma Mobile Payment Switch. Um, and within that, uh, within that matrix or key prevention mitigation response measures to address those risks as well as implementation plans and roadmaps for predict uh, and, and response me measures so you can see the central banks are investing themselves simply because now we we're developing a financial infrastructure on on ss7 and ussd which some might say is developing something you don't do something about it on, on quicksand so fill in the, the quicksand with with good cyber resilience measures and uh, risk, risk uh, management frameworks. Similarly, Central Bank of Nigeria uh, in September um, um, produced a draft, and this is on our website, uh, regulatory framework for USSD uh, for the Nigerian financial system. Um, so again, you can take a look at our website, it's on there in summary form. Uh, the, this draft policy, I think it's still out in comment phase, uh, they require the participants, the DFS service providers and the banks using USSD uh, for their clients to put in place strong mechanisms for authentication, use USSD channels for secure encryption platform, uh, implement mass PIN entry, um, and say that USSD channels not to be used to relay other electronic banking details of a customer and transmission of messages between the customer's phone and base stations uh, should be encrypted. So uh, one issue that I would raise in terms of the, the draft policy is um, is point number two, use USSD channels with secure encryption platform. Now, from what you've seen earlier on SS7 and USSD, that is difficult to impossible, simply because 1975, when they invented SS7, it was invented without security, no encryption in the clear text. So I think that point might need to be revised, but for the most, these are all laudable um, preventative and mitigant messages, um, measures that the Central Bank of Nigeria are putting in place for, as, a, as a proposal. Um, again, at a, at, a, at a supranational level, uh, something that I'm involved in um, is 
Financial Inclusion Global Initiative. It's an initiative of BIS, the World Bank, ITU, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The cleaning was just held in India. Uh, I head up the work group on DFS infrastructure security. So what we're going to be doing is technical tests, uh, regulatory interactions and best practices for regulators, uh, interaction with the payment systems um, work group, and also do some testing of checks in the wild. So we, we're going to be looking, uh, doing some very interesting tests around the world on SS7 vulnerabilities and on uh, MZ catches. And similarly, because um, blockchain technology, and again, you can look at um, the, our, our archive on blockchain um, technology, uh, there are potential vulnerabilities in using blockchain in the, in the security of blockchain themselves that we're looking at uh, and uh, that's, that's part and parcel of the, um, the, the, the figure um, investigations. So infrastructure security on SS7 and also blockchain security. So some technical solutions um, on SS7 vulnerability mitigation. So as I said, you know, there's, you know, it's a bit of a potentially dark story on the fact that SS7 has no security and now we're building a financial infrastructure on top of that. But the good news is there's some clever people out there that are putting all these mitigants together. So the signal transfer point I mentioned that connects all the, uh, the mobile networks and telecommunication networks, fixed networks, um, should be used as a central filtering point for uh, filtering and, and blocking rogue SMS messages using firewalls. So there are some third-party vendors providing these firewall systems that, that, that peek into the SS7 messages and give a yay or nay as to whether or not those messages are legit from legit providers and um, whether or not uh, they, they rogue. So I use uh, this, this, this system to undertake SS7 message clarification and also what's uh, called fingerprinting these messages for latency because Latency essentially means that somebody's looking at these messages before they're passed on to the MNO. So while somebody's peeking at these messages, intercepting them, and then passing them on as legitimate messages, uh, um, some uh, delay, very imperceptible, if you will, uh, delay is introduced. But if you've got the correct equipment, you can actually um, pick up this delay, as small as it might be and figure out from that, uh, that that somebody's trying to intrude into an SS7 um, system. Um, so similarly, uh, implement standards. Um, so NIST in the US, for example, has come up with a very interesting paper. I encourage you to look at it, actually a series of papers. Um, on, on SS7 vulnerabilities and what they recommend quite dogmatically is don't use SMS, clear text, unencrypted SMS, and unfortunately SMS is to a large extent unencrypted when it's sent as a, a one-time password by banks to you for, for two-factor authentication. They say don't do that. Find some other message, a method of, of uh, doing one-time password for two-factor authentication. Um, and some other methods report on uh, intrusions to the telecommunication and central bank, uh, whichever one has remit. And also, as I mentioned, these red team exercises are incredibly important, um, basically un unannounced uh, attacks on uh, systems as a seven and banks to check for vulnerabilities. And then the white hat uh, hackers within the red team will give you a report and say, you need to fix this. Okay, uh, on the fake base stations or the MZ, the MZ catches, um, there are some um, mitigants, um, something you as a participant in today can actually uh, do yourself, if you will. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so these checks are either done by the MNO or telecoms regulator uh, using mobile fixed detection devices, and now Android, so it's actually almost democratized. Anybody with an Android phone can act as a, a detector of MZ catches. So I know it's a, uh, I'm sort of a very um, busy name, uh, an artful name, MZ catcher catches, but that's what it's called as a term of art, MZ catcher catcher. 
Uh, these empty catcher catches check for unauthorized or unknown base station providers, off band frequency usage, uh, absence of encryption, because that's, that, that's the oxygen of uh, somebody undertaking uh, interception using an empty catcher is they switch off, they force the phone into an unencrypted state. Uh, also look for uh, suspicious um, uh, ETS features. So, for example, if you're uh, uh, finding Vodafone, uh, so these, these MZ catches, they, they come up with a legit mobile network name so that your phone logs on and you don't seem suspicious. So they say use Vodafone or Orange or T-Mobile or uh, Airtel. Um, and the suspicious part of that is if there's only a 2G network provided, um, usually these these um, these international operators provide 3G. So because the uh, that that card that I showed earlier switches off the encryption and forces the phone down to a, a, a sort of almost basic state of unencrypted um, uh, uh, state, um, it's very unlikely that the mobile network is is a is a 2G network. Um, so to that point. Uh, uh, indication of a 2G network through the MC catcher catches because they usually only transmit uh, 2G, they're not 3G, is an indication that they're starting some foul play at work. So, um, especially if those pro those mobile operators provide 3G and 4G and higher services. Um, also need to check that the base station uses open source software that's a dead giveaway, that open BTS software, which is downloadable. Um, that that's a dead giveaway that somebody's trying to uh, intercept your your, uh, your your data and voice. So um, what the MNO does also is look for presence of um, noticeable delays between the handset and MNO communications. Again, it's that latency story. And similarly, to check for the handsets connecting to the mobile operator in a what's called an A50 or unencrypted state that's been forced by the MZ catcher. So the mobile operators can look uh, at, at, at what state the phone is presenting itself to the to the operator. So if it's presenting itself as having come from a 2G network uh, that's uh, that's run by the operator ostensibly, or in an unencrypted state, uh, this last error state of the handset, which is passed onto the, the new base station uh, in handover. Uh, is a dead giveaway that there's an empty catcher at work. Now, you'll see on the right-hand side a little free software called Cell Spy Catcher. You can go onto the Google Play Store and download that uh, and, and do a little exercise to see if anybody's running an MZ catcher um, around you. And if you're driving around, it will, it will, it will stay live and capture all uh, MZ, catcher, uh, MZ catcher data. Just a little... Uh, caveat, uh, because it's on all the time, it will drain your battery. So if you are going to use it as an exercise, don't use it too long, because your battery will go dead pretty quickly. Okay, so uh, we're coming to the end. Um, monitoring and responses to cyber threats. As I said, this is, this is, these are other coordinated efforts, something called CERTS, Computer Emergency Response Team. Um, these have been uh, it's stored around the world, uh, usually at a, at a national level. Um, they have expertise and forensic response experience, um, and often in uh, within international networks. Uh, so these certs may be uh, national based, but talk to each other. Similarly, within a cert or um, uh, uh, augmented with a cert is uh, what's called a cybersecurity operations center, and those are the local monitoring of threats. So an example of a regional CSOC is something that was launched in Dakar for West Africa. Um, it did a soft launch in April this year, and October 2017, uh, they rolled it out to 11 Tier 1 and, uh, and Tier 2 um, microfinance institutions. So basically, these, these CSOCs are doing the, um, the, the checking for any intrusions and any hacking for these. These MFIs. So, in summary, um, we've got new DFS exploits 
uh, these are real. You saw from the headlines and, and what I've demonstrated to you are, are, are real threats, uh, not to be ignored, unfortunately. Um, but these vulnerabilities not properly ventilated, I think, um, versus payment security. So everybody worries about malware, but uh, the concentration up to this point has not been on SS7 um, uh, and, and related issues and the, the vulnerabilities. As I said, with Figgy and um, a lot of the, the central banks, uh, everybody is starting to look at this with a, with, a, with a very keen eye. So regulations are percolating out on USSD and SS7 from the central banks, and uh, in some cases, telecommunication regulators. And in fact, it's an interesting point is that uh, you'll see from from Nigeria, those issues, and, and, and Jordan, the USSD uh, uh, vulnerability issues were from the central bank, not the telecommunication regulator. So we've got a kind of a role reversal, which is an interesting development in, in um, DFS regulation. And the question is, uh, in all, are these existing cybersecurity standards enough to prevent, mitigate exploits and vulnerabilities? And what's important, and you saw that from from what the Central Bank of Jordan are doing uh, within uh, USSD, uh, you need a risk, proper risk management frameworks that in, if, address the uh, MFS, DFS threats directly uh, and not payment security and cyber resilience only. Uh, certainly need the cyber resilience frameworks um, and use of, of red teams. And what's critically important here is uh, and uh, as what NIST says, you need regulatory coordination. The MOUs, Memorandum on Understandings, and private-public partnership between central banks, telecom regulators, ICT ministries, uh, and, and data protection regulators that directly address the risks, prevention, um, mitigation, proper real-time reporting, and proper oversight of these of these threats. Okay, so that um, is the end of the uh, the webinar. Um, we're now going to have uh, two poll questions, um, and also while this, the polls are, are being created um, and placed on the screen, um, I'd ask you to send through if you haven't already, and I see there are some questions that have already come through to me, um, uh, some questions in the remaining time up to the, end, to the top of the hour uh, on the subject matter. So we'll wait for that, and the two poll questions are uh, how many people are doing this webinar with you now? Because we, we know that um, more than uh, one person views a, a webinar at a time. Uh, in fact, in groups around the world, we've been told. So we'd just like to do a, a survey of how many people are, are viewing the webinar. And if you are in a group, in a room, uh, could somebody step away to the computer and answer the, that poll question? And also, um, if you could tell us what your organization is. A few seconds left. Okay, we're going to be closing that off now. And don't forget, if you want to do the uh, the quiz, the quiz starts at the top of the hour um, and is available for two two hours. And if you join late, please remember that you need your DFSO login um, details, credentials, username, and password to be able to do the quiz. So um, we've we've got um, we've got a few questions that have come through. Um, so I, I, one from uh, Jatanda Handu. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, DFS in developing countries using feature phones and USSD is very low ticket size. Does it even make economic sense? Uh, I assume this is economic sense to a bad actor to intrude into this for low value ticket uh, DFS business. Um, so the answer to that, uh, Jacinda, thank you for your question, is yes. Because if you do this at a large industrial scale, you saw from my, my slide right at the beginning, uh, that this is done now on an industrial scale. So if you do many of these low value ticket items and you, you, you skim a few cents here or there, you can add up to millions and millions very, very quickly over over time, especially if the values are imperceptible because they they could even be rounding errors, if you will. Um, so uh, even though it's of low ticket size um, for now, 
uh, it's growing. You'll see the DFS ecosystem is is growing, uh, and this has all been done on USSD um, to a great extent because of the uh, non-available availability of 3G networks that people still have to use 2G feature phones. The DFS ecosystem is growing. Uh, credit provision is growing. Other other transactional services are growing. So then, therefore, now to to some extent might be low ticket, but very soon um, these these items are going to grow into into more macro and less micro ticket value sizes. Okay, so I have a question from uh, Amar in Tunisia. Um, thank you, Amar, for your question. Uh, you ask, given that SMS operates over SS7, is SMS as an OTP still viable? Um, great question. I first saw that in the uh, earlier slide on what the US NIST said. Um, look, OTP by SMS is, is the way it's being done for now. Uh, it's not going away anytime soon, but the point is, as a two factor authentication me method, you have to be very careful that um, that that is, um, is is viable and secure. Uh, and as NIST says, it's they recommend that SMS via OTP is, is not done. In in many countries, that's not even an option. You need OTP by SMS. Some uh, some providers are using push USSD um, instead of uh, OTP by SMS. But as I've showed you before, uh, USSD is, is a different side of the same SS7 coin or MAP coin. Uh, it's also vulnerable. So even though the network initiators initiate to push USSD session, then ask you to put your uh, PIN number in, uh, that is also vulnerable. Uh, we, we haven't seen too many push USSD uh, uh, threats in the wild yet, but um, not to say they aren't. So unfortunately, still as far as using SS7, uh, anything that 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 uh, uses SS7, USSD, and SMS is vulnerable. Yeah, to take a message, and you, you need to be very aware as a provider of of those vulnerabilities and uh, um, put risk management frameworks into to mitigate the threat. Um, okay, um, I'm just looking through the questions. Um, Peter Customers, why is GSMA not engaged on security issues in the dictated base station security upgrades to SS7? I think they they have to some great extent are having that interacted with GSMA and they are part of the uh, FIGI initiative. Um, so the, there is some, and they, they, they have engaged uh, um, security experts. So it's not that they are unaware of it. Uh, in fact, last year in, 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 um, in Geneva in June, uh, the ITU, International Telecommunications uh, Union, um, held a roundtable on SS7 vulnerabilities, and there was a GSM uh, uh, speaker uh, there. Um, having said that, there is an upgrade, if you will, to SS7 called Dialog. Um, now, that's very expensive uh, to implement um, because what you need is you need coordination between all the telecommunication providers around the world. Uh, that they all implement this thing called dialogue. And the analogy I use is that would, the cost-wise, that would mean that um, you would go to a country and pull out every single copper cable uh, at great cost and replace it again at great cost uh, with fiber optic. That's the equivalent of, of what, you, what, what, what needs to be done in moving from, from SS7 to dialogue. So dialogue is a component of LTE. Um, long-term evolution, which is your, your 4G type services. Um, but you need backwards compatibility. I don't think you'd, you'd want people to rip out SS7 because, quite frankly, you'd never be able to send SMS messages, messages from one country to another. Um, those who've got SS7 and those are upgraded, you need them to be, to, to be on the same system, if you will. Uh, you wouldn't be able to row at, at the most extreme case. Um, so SS7, uh, is, is going to be around for uh, quite a while, and, and GSMA, as I said, are, and I won't speak for them totally, but I know they are uh, uh, aware of it. 
Okay, I'm just looking through some other. Um, okay, so, uh, Rona from Jakarta. Um, Rona, thanks very much. I know it's around going on 10 p.m. Jakarta time in Indonesia. Thanks for staying up. Um, you mentioned reporting of intrusions. How is this done, or how is this, should this be done? Now, Rona, that's a great question. Um, so you, you'll see from my slide from uh, Central Bank of Nigeria and Central Bank of Jordan, it's the uh, central bank which has taken the lead, if you will, from uh, on, on these SSM and USSD vulnerabilities, and, and significantly not the telecommunications regulator. So to that point is, if there's an intrusion, uh, who do you report it to? And do you report it? Is there a framework that the regulators put in place and said, look, if there's an intrusion, you need to uh, send a, a, a note to us immediately and saying we're under attack or we've been attacked and 50, 1,000, 100,000 people were affected. Uh, we've fixed it um, and we put these preventative messages, uh, measures in place. So those frameworks are not settled. They're developing, you can see CBN and CBJ are, are developing that. Uh, Jordan pretty pretty advanced in terms of the risk management framework. Actually, sorry, uh, if you whoever there was, you can switch if you're sure. Um so uh the the it, it, so uh, it's not clear uh, who has regulatory oversight, and that I think is being developed through MOUs between the telecoms regulator and the um, and, and, and the central banks, because obviously one has a financial implication, uh, and the other one has a, 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 a mobile and telecoms infrastructure implication, um, and, and not a good result all around. Um, but Having seen some MOUs uh, uh, between regulators, the, the central banks and the telecom regulators, I can say quite assuredly that, that this is being addressed. And who reports what and, and, and under what circumstances is also um, is also uh, being developed. And I think the regtech solutions that are that are being uh, that are evolving will certainly uh, certainly address that. Um, so. Fernanda in uh, Lima, Peru has got a question. Uh, how do the new vulnerabilities affect the service agreements in terms of conditions that you sign with the, your DFS provider or bank? So again, a good question uh, addressed very briefly earlier on. Um, as I mentioned, um, right now uh, the, the, there is contractual asymmetry. So the provider will say, if there's a hack or uh, uh, of, of uh, it, it must have been you, the, the consumer, um, because we, the provider, couldn't have been hacked. We've got rock solid security. So, within this SS7 intrusion issue, uh, it could be argued that that dogmatic statement is no longer true um, because the providers themselves can be, can be uh, uh, intruded on and um, uh, for many in the world, people can uh, can, can access um, USSD and SS7 and get into the uh, service provider uh, system and move funds w without the the customer even knowing. So uh, to answer your question directly, I think you're going to see a trend towards changing those uh, terms and conditions to reflect shared responsibility, uh, or, or but certainly not. Uh, only the customer being responsible for um, for the loss of value if there is loss of value. Okay, um, we're coming to the end of the webinar. Um, so this again is the last webinar of of the uh, of the year. Uh, but just a brief request to you, um, please, if you are a regulator or have access to laws and regulations, or you have some interesting DFS papers, please send us your laws regulations. Circulars uh, to info at dfsobservatory.com so we can put it into our database in any language you choose to send it would be very, very welcome. Uh, please send us any DFS policy related papers. 
and uh, any MOUs, memorandum, understanding between central bank, telco regulators, or even competition regulators. We're all working on a model MOU, um, and we'd like to see what's been done around the world as best practice so we can incorporate into the model MOU. Again, if you have that papers or laws, regulations, or anything that you've, you've heard about that's been passed or put out for draft in the past, uh, well, please send it to info at dfsobservatory.com. Uh, so, just want to go and go over the post webinar quiz, which is um, just about live. Uh, the webinar quiz link is in the instruction mail for this webinar. Again, you must use your DFSO username and password to log in. Otherwise, if you click on the link, uh, it won't allow you to go in the quiz. So use, put your username and password in. Um, but if you, for some reason, don't have any uh, joy, send us a mail um, at info.dfsobservatory.com. Uh, Mike Wessler um, is on standby to help you um, if you can't log into the quiz. And again, you have two hours to complete the 10 multiple choice questions, and if you've been pretty attentive to the contents of the slides, you will have absolutely no problem, I think, in uh, getting through it. So, from New York, it, um, I'm going to bid you farewell and wish you all the best, holiday greetings, and all the best for um, for 2018, a healthy, prosperous, and successful 2018 to you all. And for those who in the quiz, good luck for the quiz. So, from the webinar, team here in uh, Columbia University at CITI in New York. Uh, it's a goodbye from us. Thank you.